Welcome to the Canadian edition of The Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. You instilled in me the truth of the Word of God and in my husband that led to my healing and the changes in my life and my family's life and in our future. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing teaching verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. And I tell you, this has been powerful. We are now into my third week of teaching and I've taken my footnotes that are on a digital uh, copy of a uh, living commentary is what we call it. We call it a living commentary because I'm still writing it. Matter of fact, I wrote footnotes just yesterday. And so it's a living commentary. If you buy this digital living commentary, every time you go on our website, you automatically get all of the new footnotes. I've now written footnotes on over 27,000 verses out of the 31,000 verses in the Bible. And this book, this is the first time we've ever offered this. And this is a 200 plus page book that takes my footnotes from this living commentary and put it into printed form so that you have a hardback copy of this. We are asking for a donation uh, towards this hardback book, but then we also have CDs, DVDs, and a USB that we're taking from the television programs. And at the end of our program, we'll give you information about how you can receive all of these products. But this book of Hebrews is powerful. And it is one of the clearest explanations between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It was written specifically to turn people from the Old Covenant way of relating to God to this New Testament. And I'm not over into Hebrews chapter 8 yet, but in verse 6, it says we have a new and a better covenant that is established upon better promises. That kind of summarizes the point that is being made here in Hebrews uh, throughout the entire book. If you've missed any of this, please get these materials. Please listen to this because I promise you that this is a missing link in most people's Christian walk. They don't understand the grace and the mercy that is extended to us through Jesus and they are still trying to relate to God based on their own performance instead of having a Savior that has purchased everything for us through what He did, not through what you do. That is really, really, really important. So yesterday, I started talking about the importance of the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says that uh, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And I ended with verse 13 yesterday that says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And man, uh, this is just amazing if you look these things up in the Hebrew. I talked about some of that last y yesterday. Let me just read this out of the Amplified Classic Edition. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. It says, And not a creature exists that is concealed from his sight, but all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Man, that's powerful. And you know, this scares some people because there's actually parts of their life that they've, it's like if you could have a house, they've just shut the door, they've locked it, they don't ever go in there. They don't even go in there, much less do they want anybody else to see it. And there's things in their life that they are trying to hide from God. But I'm telling you that when Adam and Eve sinned, they should have run to God, not from God. They shouldn't have tried to hide themselves and cover their shame. They should have gone to the Lord. He made coats of skin for them and covered them. God loves you. And yes, the Lord wants to expose and get rid of these negative things that are in your life that are destroying you and destroying other people. But He's going to do it in love. And we need to open up our heart. And the way you do this is through the Word of God. This is exactly what these verses are saying, that there is nothing hidden from God, that everything is naked and open to Him. And if we would just get the Word of God and if you would humble yourself, God would go into those recesses of your heart that even you don't go to. 
and he would deal with those things and take the very things that are negative in your life and turn them to positives. I know that there's some people watching this thinking, well, that's too good to be true. That's not what I've heard about God. I've heard that God is this harsh taskmaster, and if he was to see these things in my heart, somehow or another you think you're hiding things from God. But this says everything is naked and open under the sight of him with whom we have to deal. God knows what's going on. You need to let God's Word come in and shine the light. You know, sin, evil in our heart is kind of like a fungus. And if you, if you keep it in the dark, that's where it grows. But when you expose a fungus to the light, it'll kill it. And if you take the light of God's Word and let it just shine through every part of your heart, it will get rid of things in your life that are hurting you and hurting other people. And it's a process, and sometimes there's a painful process when you recognize things, but it's, it's necessary. It's worth the effort. If you back up just a few verses in verse 11, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Let us labor to enter into this rest, this place to where you are just at peace with God. You have to labor. There's some things you have to work through. It takes some effort to rest in the love of God, but it is well worth the effort. In verse 15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. In the context, what he just said was that the Word of God makes everything naked and open in the eyes of him. But that's not so that he can come in and hurt you. It's so that he can come in and set you free. And in this verse, it says he's our high priest. Did you know the high priest was there to intercede for the people that were bringing the sacrifice, not to condemn them? Man, there, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is over in Isaiah chapter 53 where it's talking about... You know, let me just turn over and read this because I'm not sure I could quote this. But in Isaiah chapter 53, it's the passage of Scripture that talks about Jesus becoming our sacrifice... And it says uh, in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Talking about it pleased God the Father to bruise Jesus. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. This is talking about God saw the travail of Jesus' soul and shall be satisfied. He doesn't see your travail. He sees His travail. Jesus became this lamb that was sacrificed for you. And going back to the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is a high priest. Did you know when a person sinned, they brought a sacrifice to the priest? And the priest had to examine the sacrifice to see if this sacrifice was without blemish because it was symbolic of Jesus. But get this picture. When you came to a priest with the sacrifice, it was an admission on your part that you had sinned. You had done something wrong, and so you were approaching God and asking for forgiveness. But what did the high priest do? Did he come and analyze you? Did he look at you and say, Have you repented? Have you done this? Have you now made restitution? And he didn't start preaching to you and talking about you. Instead, he examined the sacrifice and he was pleased. God accepted you based on the sacrifice, not based on you and what you had done. Man, if you understand that, that is such an awesome picture, and it fits perfectly with what's being said in Hebrews. That's the reason Hebrews chapter 15 says, For we have a high priest. This priest is there to intercede for you, not to condemn you. God's Word will shine a light on things in your life, but not for the purpose of condemnation. It's to set you free. You can't deal with things by just trying to ignore it, trying to put it into the past, trying to put somehow or another hide it. You need to expose it to this light, and this light will literally kill that evil that's on the inside of you. You know, I know I've got all kinds of people watching this program all around the world, and I can guarantee you there are people watching this that you're thinking that you've just done too much. You've got so many sins in your life that God could never forgive you, and you're listening to me and thinking, could this be true? 
I'm telling you, I have been cleansed of things. I know other people that have done things I've never even thought about doing that have been cleansed and now are walking in the freedom that Jesus purchased for them. You can be cleansed from all things. I think it's Acts chapter 13, but it says now we can be cleansed of all things from which we could not be cleansed under the law of Moses. Under the old covenant, there were some things that were just uh, beyond reach. But in the new covenant, Jesus has paid for all of your sins, past, present, and even sins you haven't committed yet. We're going to get to that in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. But this is powerful. Jesus is a high priest and he has been touched with the same things. Because God Almighty became a man, he lived on this earth and he suffered he didn't suffer sin until he came on the cross, but he suffered and he knows the frailties of being a person. Jesus got hungry. Jesus got tired. Jesus had people come against him. People, had, people ignored Jesus. He went through rejection. He went through feeling insignificant. The people treated him that way. He's been touched with the feelings of our infirmities and yet he did it without sin. This says that he was touched with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Did you know that there's some people who think, well, Jesus wasn't tempted with, you know, some of the things that we have in our modern world today. He wasn't tempted with, uh, you know, the, the, the pressures of this life and all of the high pressure things, the traffic and, and all of the things where people are trying to do multiple jobs and stuff, and they think that, no, he wasn't tempted. This says he was tempted in all points. The way that I understand that is 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is saying that there's basically three areas that we can be tempted in. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Did you know if you go back to the Garden of Eden and see the temptation that came against Adam and Eve, it says that Eve saw the tree. That was the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was good for food. It would satisfy her flesh and the pride of life. It would make her wiser than God. You can say that that temptation dealt with these three areas. When Jesus was tempted, recorded in Matthew chapter 4, and in Luke chapter 4, there were three temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So sometimes people think, well, Jesus wasn't tempted with what I was tempted with. If you peel back the layers and go to the root of all sins, he was tempted exactly as you and I were. And the reason that this is so significant is because he suffered these temptations. He knows what you're going through and he can be a merciful and faithful high priest towards you. And he, he knows exactly what you're going through. Jesus struggled without succumbing to those sins. He overcame those sins. You know, if you were going to have some kind of a financial advisor, all of us have financial problems, but you don't want a financial advisor who failed and is bankrupt. You want somebody who's overcome their adversities and a su success at it. Jesus was tempted, but he succeeded without giving in to that. And because of that, Jesus can have mercy upon you and minister unto you. And in verse 16, it says, Let us therefore, because Jesus is now a faithful high priest that has been tempted like you've been tempted and understands what you're going through. Because of that, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Man, that is powerful. Did you know it says in the time of need? This isn't talking about when you've done everything right, when you're on your best behavior, you've been going to church, paying your tithes, studying the Bible, you've been doing everything just right. Then you can come boldly. No, this says come boldly under the throne of grace, not the throne of justice, the throne of grace. <laughs> Amen. You know, I, I, had, I used to develop pictures for a living and we would have people come in and they'd look at these pictures and they'd say, well, this doesn't do me justice. And I never was bold enough to say this, but in private, we would make jokes about this and we would tell people, says, uh, lady, you don't need justice. You need mercy, <laughs> amen. 
This is saying that we come before the throne of grace. The very wording here shows you that Jesus is a high priest. The Word of God, it will set you free. God's not here to condemn you and to beat you down. God is to set you free from all of this guilt and condemnation. So because He's a high priest who's been tempted in all of the ways that we've been tempted, we ought to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, not justice, mercy, Did you know mercy is not getting the punishment that you deserve? Grace is getting all of the goodness of God that you don't deserve. So grace and mercy are like opposite extremes. Mercy is not getting the judgment that you deserve. Grace is getting all of the goodness of God that you don't deserve. So let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Praise God. Boy, this is awesome. Again, I wish I had time to put all of this in its proper context because if you put it in the context talking about Hebrews chapter 4, the rest of God, there is a Sabbath rest. I taught on that last week. Man, that just adds deeper understanding, more impact in your life if you understand it in its context. Going into chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is actually going back to Hebrews chapter 3 where it started talking about that Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our profession. So he had been talking about this for two chapters. Now he's coming back using this illustration that the Old Testament priests were symbolic. They were a picture of what Jesus was going to do for us in the New Testament. Now that we have the reality in Jesus, we don't go by the picture that is in the Old Testament. Nobody has to have a priest come offer an animal sacrifice for you today. Nobody has to have a priest stand between them and God. You do not have to have somebody with their collar turned around backwards to intercede for you to God. I know that there are some denominations in the Christian church that still promote all of that, but that is completely contrary to all of this. Jesus is now the apostle and high priest of our profession. And when we get over to Hebrews chapter 10, it makes a big deal out of this that now we can enter boldly into the very throne of God, into the holy of holies. And these scriptures are going to talk about this. And so again, many people miss a lot of the points that are being made because they aren't familiar with the Old Testament priesthood and the way things were done. And so this is written to people who were religious, people who had lived under this old covenant law that was very condemning and very strict, and it's specifically trying to bring them into this New Testament liberty and freedom that we have in Jesus. So that first verse is talking about we have a high priest now that is standing for us to God and is talking about Jesus, not a man. In verse 2 it says, Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. This is just saying that an Old Testament priest, he had mercy on people because he also was a sinner and stuff. So Jesus became a man and he didn't sin himself. He took our sins on the cross, but in his life he lived above sin but he suffered being tempted in all points like as we are, and that makes him a merciful and faithful high priest for us. In verse 3 it says, And by reason hereof, talking about the Old Testament priest, they also had sinned and had failures in their life. Because of that, he ought, talking about this priest, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So Jesus was symbolic or the Old Testament priests were symbolic of Jesus, but of course they had sin. Jesus didn't have sin. And in verse 4 it says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So in other words, you just couldn't choose to be priest. You had to be a certain uh, house of the tribe of Levi, and you had to be chosen by God. So likewise, Jesus had to be chosen by God. So in verse 5 it says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, 
But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That is a quotation from Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. It says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And if you read in Acts chapter 13, verse 33, this is actually talking about not when he came into this earth as a babe, but when he was raised from the dead. That's the day that that verse is talking about when he was begotten from the dead. And so it quotes from Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. And in verse 6 it says, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now this is a quotation from Psalms chapter 110 in verse 4. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you know, I'm running short of time on today's program, and so I'm going to have to continue this on tomorrow's program. But real quickly, let me just mention that the only priest in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament law, they were all had to be Levites. They had to come from the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek wasn't even a Jew. Melchizedek is uh, mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham came and gave tithes of all of his spoil unto Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. But Abraham, uh, Melchizedek was not a Jew. And yet this verse, it was a prophecy given by David that there would come a Messiah and he would be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then as it goes into the 6th and the 7th chapter, this is going to become one of the major things that is used by the writer of Hebrews to show that since there is a change in the law, there has to be a change. I mean, since there's a change in the priesthood, there has to be a change in the law, and he uses this to show that we are no longer under the Old Testament law because Melchizedek wasn't a Levite. Therefore, he wasn't justified under the Old Testament law to be a priest, and yet he functioned as a priest, blessed Abraham. It says in Hebrews chapter 7 that the less is blessed of the greater. So Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, and yet he wasn't a Jew. And if Jesus was going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek and not after the order of Aaron, that meant that all of these things are going to have to change. This was radical to an Old Testament Jew who the Old Testament law and the priesthood controlled everything. The book of Hebrews is saying that when you throw out the priesthood, then you have to also throw out the law, and we have a brand new way of relating to God. This is going to get into some powerful, powerful things. I'm out of time today, but let me once again just encourage you to please get this hardback copy of my footnotes on every single verse in the book of Hebrews. This is really powerful. I have this digital copy that I've written over 27,000 footnotes in the entire Bible, but we have uh, over 200 pages hard copy printed out these footnotes, and this would be a blessing to you. So we're going to uh, make that available and also CDs and DVDs, and here's a USB that will have the audio and the video both in there, and I encourage you to please get these materials. You know, some of these things get a little technical and some people think, I don't want to know this, but you need to know this. It's, it's a foundation of the new covenant. So please listen to our announcer as he repeats and gives you all the information on how you can get these products. And then please call or write today to receive. Do you want to dive deeper into God's Word? Now you can with Andrew Womack's Living Commentary. I'd like to encourage you to get this living commentary. We call it a living commentary because I'm still writing it. And I've written footnotes on over 27,000 verses in the Bible. And I promise you, this is powerful. It's not only got my commentary and experiences and revelations that God has given me, but it's got Greek and Hebrew words defined. It's got references and just all kinds of things here. It would be a tremendous blessing to you. So check it out, our living commentary. The Living Commentary includes two dictionaries, four commentaries, and 12 versions of the Bible, plus atlases and biblical maps. Grow in the Word with Andrew's Living Commentary software. You can enjoy the Word of God wherever you are, on your phone, computer, or tablet. Download the Living Commentary today. You were created with a purpose. 
written in the heart of God long before you were born. He is calling you to find it. We want to help you experience his unconditional love to be equipped and empowered to become a world changer. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto, and we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways, but we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Carius Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with the life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Also, to learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. You can listen to them while you're online or download them for later and listen on the go. Remember, that's awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Andrew is pleased to announce the release of his brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality. This hardback book includes all of Andrew's personal study notes and commentary on the book of Hebrews as compiled from Andrew's Living Commentary software. Discover the transformative truths of the book of Hebrews when you get Andrew's brand new book, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, today. Andrew's complete series, Hebrews, Living in the New Covenant Reality, is available as a book CD album, TV, DVD album, and USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources are available when you contact us. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. Andrew has many conferences and seminars around the globe each year. For the latest information on Andrew's complete speaking schedule, visit our website at awmc.ca events.